Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to Avid Online. And for those who are joining us for the very first time, a special welcome. Avid Online is an innovative digital further learning campaign launched during the first lockdown on April 1st, 2020. We're now over a year old and 250 plus programs later. We can say that although 2020 challenged us in unprecedented ways, we managed to stay positive, relevant, engaged, and engaging. We've continued to champion and bring to our audiences the best of the arts and culture while supporting the creative communities, facilitating growth, dialogue within the artistic ecosystem. Please refer to the chat box for more information about Avid Learning, our platform, and as evident, we continue to stay true to our mantra that learning never stops. This brings me to our evening session to mark the occasion of World Environment Day 2021. Rare India and Avid Learning present Sustainability Now, Tourism and the Environment. Today's session will look at how the pandemic has adversely impacted the tourism industry in India and the second wave has further deepened the crisis. However, it's difficult to convince our traveling hearts. With many of us making shifts to conscious living with clean eating, active lifestyles, why not look towards sustainable tourism to fuel our wanderlust? This panel will discuss the rise and growth of sustainable and ecotourism, outline the many challenges faced in the travel sector in this regard, and explore the corresponding solutions that can and have been devised and implemented. As many of you know, a year ago, we launched the Sustainability Now series. This thematized and targeted series of discussions, videos, masterclasses, and more covered a range of topics from architecture, art, design, heritage, technology, fashion, textiles, materiality, food, agriculture, all in the context of sustainable practices and philosophies. The main aim was to raise awareness about sustainability related concerns and issues and convert our audiences into change makers and active custodians and custodians of a greener future. Today, we will be presenting the 33rd program in this series. Allow me to introduce our evening speakers who are each doing remarkable work in this space. Managing Director and Owner, Jamtara Wilderness, Kana Jungle Lodge, Bandagar Jungle Lodge, Amit Shankhara. Founder and Director, Ecosphere, Ishita Khanna. Founder, Green People, Rupesh Rai. They will be in conversation with our moderator for the evening, author and travel writer, the shooting star, Shivya Nath. For more about our very impressive speakers, please refer to their bios that have been posted in the chat section. They should have been emailed to you also earlier. Please note, this session will last 75 minutes, followed by a 15-minute Q&A in which uh, Shivya will be taking your questions. So do keep posting them in the Q&A box throughout. On that note, over to you, Shivya. Look forward to your introduction and a fascinating session. Bon voyage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asad, for that great introduction. And uh, thank you for putting together this session on sustainable tourism. Um, I'm going to begin sharing my screen now. So, um, so I think this is a really relevant session uh, that we're doing today, considering that we're in the midst of a pandemic, a second wave, uh, and we're also facing a climate crisis. Um, so let me just begin with a quick introduction about myself and a bit about my work. And then I'll pass it on to each of the panelists today to talk a little bit about their work through their own presentations. And then we'll get into the discussion and have some pretty tough questions to discuss today. So um, I've been a travel writer for about a decade. Uh, I've written for the likes of BBC Travel, National Geographic. Uh, I've published my own book as well, uh, which is focused on meaningful travel. And for the last few years, my focus has been on slow and sustainable travel. And I know as a traveler that when we hear the word sustainable tourism, it sounds kind of boring, sounds like jargon. But having traveled for over 10 years now, I can, I can promise you that it's also the most adventurous and most fulfilling way to travel. 
uh, I mean, just by by way of making more responsible choices, I've been able to connect with some really cool people doing impactful work all the way from Iran to Guatemala. Uh, in an attempt to cut down the number of flights I take, I've been doing slower land journeys. So uh, before the pandemic hit, I did a land journey uh, from Thailand via Myanmar to Northeast India. And I ended up exploring parts of Myanmar that I otherwise would never have gone to. So what I've realized in my journey is that travel doesn't have to be damaging for the planet or the people of the places that we visit. Uh, it can be good for people, good for the planet, and also more meaningful for our own selves. So I guess the turning point in my journey was uh, when I landed up in this beautiful valley called Spiti. Uh, and coincidentally, we have one of the panelists from Spiti as well. Uh, so this was back in 2011 when I was working full time with the Singapore Tourism Board. Um, and even though I enjoyed my work, I felt a bit burnt out with the whole nine to five routine. So I convinced my bosses to allow me to take uh, a two month unpaid sabbatical from work. And I ended up volunteer traveling with Ecosphere. And it was the first time that I was traveling with an organization that literally put people and the planet before uh, at, at the forefront of all their offerings. Uh, and I think that really impacted me. Uh, it made me think about, you know, other ways of living and other ways of traveling. Uh, and I ended up quitting my full-time job, moving back to India and pursuing my career as a travel writer. And then in 2013, I, um, I decided to give up my apartment. All my work was online. So uh, I sold most of my stuff and I've been living out of two bags since. Uh, of course, that was pre-pandemic. Um, but in addition to being a travel writer, I've also found ways to sort of give back to the places that I've taken so much from. Um, so I just want to share some of the passion projects that I've been working on in the past few years. Around 2015, 2016, I landed up in a place called Sarmoli, which is part of the Munsiari Tessel. Uh, I'm sure Rupesh is familiar with it. Uh, it's in a remote part of Uttarakhand, uh, maybe about an 11 hour journey from the nearest train station or airport. Um, and something very interesting was happening in this village, which is that every summer, locals gather together to run high altitude marathons, to go bird watching, practice yoga, learn Wikipedia, and so on. And the interesting thing is, these activities are not geared towards tourists. They're very much geared towards the local audience, but any travelers who want to join them are welcome to join. So typically, somebody like me, a travel writer, would go to a place like this and bring their stories to the internet, to social media and so on. But I figured, you know, if they can learn Wikipedia, why not Instagram? So we ended up doing an Instagram and photography workshop in the village. Uh, we crowdsourced some smartphones through my blog and we started what is perhaps India's first and only Instagram channel to be run entirely by a rural village community. It's called Voices of Munsiari and I urge you to follow them on Instagram. Uh, this initiative was covered by a whole bunch of publications like Times of India, Condé Nast Travel, etc. And they started calling it Instagram, India's first Instagram village. Uh, next, I'm going to show you a short video about a campaign that we did to raise awareness against uh, the growing single-use plastic crisis in the mountains. Hopefully it buffers. I think my screen's frozen. Oops. Yeah. Uh, and that's the last project I want to talk about. So I guess when the pandemic hit in March 2020, 
um, everyone who was associated with the tourism industry pretty much lost their incomes overnight. Uh, but of course, those of us living in urban areas were able to use the internet and digital opportunities to work from home. But people based in rural areas didn't have access to many of the same opportunities. So I co-founded an initiative called Voices of Rural India, which is essentially a curated platform where uh, communities from across the country, uh, the rural parts of the country, can share their own stories in their own voices, be it through words, uh, photographs, videos, uh, in whatever language that they're comfortable with. And then we also translate it in English and carry an English version. Uh, and storytellers get paid a fee for each story that's approved for publishing. Uh, so it's a way for them to build their digital storytelling skills, as well as have this alternate source of livelihood. Um, and at the same time, for travelers like us who are desperately missing the road, this is a way to explore uh, remote corners of India that uh, hopefully we'll be able to travel someday to again. So just to give you some examples, uh, we've had a young student from the Titan Valley in Himachal uh, share a very intimate story about a local festival where men wear skirts of grass and yell abuses at bad spirits to chase them away. We have an Amchi from Spiti who wrote about uh, why, people still, why people eat stones as a medicine. Uh, and we've also had a 63-year-old woman from a village in Wayanad in Kerala who shared how she's become a walking library. Uh, so she walks several kilometers every day across her hilly village, uh, distributing books to people and collecting books back from them as a library. Uh, and you can check out this initiative at voicesofruralindia.org and connect with rural storytellers through it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's me. My blog is called The Shooting Star. I'm on Instagram as Shivya. Uh, these are some of the platforms that uh, I've been, my story's been featured on and my book, um, you can see that as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, our first panelist. Uh, I've been talking so much about Spiti, so I'm going to hand it over to Ishita Khanna from uh, Spiti Ecosphere. As uh, Asad mentioned, she's the founder and director of Ecosphere, and she's been working there since 2002 uh, at the Conference of Responsible Travel and Sustainable Development. Uh, she was voted as an MTV youth icon and has consistently been featured among India's leading social entrepreneurs. And personally, for me, she's one, she's one of my biggest inspirations in India's travel industry. So over to you, Ishita. Thanks, Shivya. That was, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for the introduction. It was quite uh, flattering. And uh, so I'll, I'll share my screen as well. So yeah, so uh, I'm Ishita and uh, I'm one of the founders of a social enterprise called Spiti Ecosphere. Uh, we've been working in Spiti for close to two decades now. And uh, when we first got there, I mean, it's a beautiful part of the, of, the of the country and one perhaps one of the remotest parts in India. It's tucked away in Himachal Pradesh. It's a very, very challenging place to live in. So when we first got there, we looked at how we could address and find solutions to the problems that the local communities face out there. Tourism was something that was just about trickling into Spiti. People didn't even know that Spiti existed where it was. So we looked at how we could basically kind of like, you know, mold the tourism that was coming into the area in a way that the positives could outweigh the negatives because we are all aware tourism is a double-edged sword. It has its negatives. It has its positives as well if it's developed in the right way. Yeah, so that's what uh, we looked at right at the start to look at how we could, uh, you know, have that kind of an impact. So we looked at the obvious. We looked at how more money could percolate down to the local communities. So be it through homestays, various activities, uh, trails, you know, so that on the one hand, you know, they could earn livelihoods from this. But on the other hand, it could also become kind of like an incentive for them to preserve their cultural heritage or be it their, the nature, the wildlife. So those were some of the aspects that we worked out and what emerged as a bonus was that these experiences and these, uh, you know, these various activities that we had developed actually enhanced the, the experience of a traveler, you know, because it was just so much more immersive and they actually got an insight into the local culture of the area. But then, of course, there are the obvious negatives and Sylvia has touched upon that. So one of the biggest problems is garbage, especially from bottled water. So we looked at, you know, various ways on how we could address this. One of them was, of course, getting the traveler involved and raising awareness that, hey, each trip of yours is creating mounds of plastic bottles out here in Spiti. So we create that, created this 
art installation, you know, to try and remind travelers of the garbage that they're leaving behind. We also set up water refill points across Piti Valley so people could, uh, you know, go and uh, refill their bottles there, try and minimize their impact while they're in Spiti. And that's our drink and drive initiative where we gave all of our travelers a, a water bottle, something similar to this, you know, that they can refill across Piti instead of having to buy uh, bottled water as they go along. And of course, then looking at how we could, you know, recycle and send this plastic down as well. One of the obvious negatives of uh, tourism is uh, the carbon emissions that we have. So there is not much that we can do about that because if you travel, you create carbon. But what we did at our end was to try and minimize the carbon on our trips as well as calculate it carefully and then offset that, you know, uh, through our various renewable energy projects, which brings me to now our initiatives, which is actually the heart and soul of Spiti Ecosphere. Uh, where we try and create, where we've taken basically travel a step further, where we try and create a synergy between travel and sustainable development. So over the years, so we over the years we've worked on various programs where we've had travelers get involved, where we've had volunteers from across the world come in and uh, you know work on various programs that basically address some of the challenges that that Spiti faces. So be it like access to vegetables through the year or be it uh, the limited healthcare facilities in this area. You know, so our, our passive solar, our renewable energy projects, I mean, this platform is, is I don't have much time, but I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, renewable energy projects that we work on, which then offset the carbon and uh, the amount of wood that gets uh, burnt in these areas. So all of this, we've tried to link up and create synergies with travel and the revenues that we generate from travel. And of course, volunteers that come in and help us a lot on these programs. So, I mean, in a nutshell, basically not just traveling to Spiti, but trying to make it, you know, like trying to help in the development of the area as well. So that's a bit about Ecosphere. I'll hand it back to Shivya. Thanks, Ishita. That was great. I'm looking forward to asking you questions about uh, how Spiti has changed over the years and where the tourism industry goes from here. But in the meantime, let's move on to our next panelist, uh, Amit Sankala. Amit is the managing director and owner of Jamtara Wilderness, Kana Jungle Lodge, and Bandhaka Jungle Lodge. And in fact, he grew up in the forest, literally. Uh, his grandfather was a forest officer, and his family has been involved in wildlife tourism for a long time. Um, and I think he's brought in more values of sustainability, conservation, and community to wildlife conservation. Um, and we'd like to hear from you, Amit. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, can you see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Shivya, for the introduction. And uh, great to learn about Ishita as well. I kind of feel like going there now. Uh, but uh, just just uh, my background goes that my, my three generations of mine have been involved in conservation, wildlife, uh, particularly around the tiger. My grandfather was the founder director of Project Tiger. So, you know, it was like by default, you know, you are the kid who's going to do uh, wildlife tourism uh, in, in your lifetime. But for me, it, it became much more of a passion. My grandfather died at the age of 69, father at the age of 47. So when I got into this, when I was 19, 20 years old, for me, it was, uh, you know, can you live in the jungle and, and run a business while doing it? And for me, that passion sort of came out automatically because of how I had grown up in all this era. Uh, my my father, grandfather really affected the way, uh, you know, my grandfather at, in, in the early 70s when Project Tiger was launching. There's a lot of stories that sort of I learned while growing up on how national parks were made, how boundaries were put up, how the working with the community used to happen at that given time. And then my father went on to create uh, some of the first uh, ecologists in central India in Madhya Pradesh at that time in Kana and Bandagar. Uh, where you know getting to even a, a lodge in central india took about 20 hours uh, by a 12 to 14 hour train ride and then another, another couple of hours of ride so that whole thing was a sense of adventure a sense of expedition that we don't you know usually have today and when it came my time to start creating lodges I, I wanted to do things a little bit differently in in the sense of i did not want to go back to areas where there were already many, many lodges that existed. I wanted to create and touch new areas by causing a positive impact on where we were going. 
uh, that everything that we were doing. And this is sort of one of our initiatives called the star bed. Some of you may have seen these, this image in, in magazines around. Uh, and the idea was, hey, the farmer has slept out here for you know decades, for, for almost a century, uh, chasing away wildlife from, uh, to, to protect their crops. And they see amazing wildlife that passes through it. Why can't we enjoy it and protect the wildlife? And while we do it, pay the farmer in return have sort of a community sharing model. In India, uh, private conservancies really don't exist, but community partnerships can exist in, very, in even in wildlife areas. And there is theming wildlife just even in the buffer areas of the parks. So for us, it all became about community, about getting people involved, getting the tribes involved. A lot of these people have worked with us for almost 20 years. Uh, and it, depending on where you are, how you work with them, the trust building is the most important part of it. And that for me became passion of what I do at, at anywhere I go, uh, whether I work with snow leopards up in the Himalayas, in Gujarat with the remote tribes out there, or in central India where my camps are uh, in those areas, it all became about people. How can we involve the community, make it 90, 95% locals, and not just in the, the, the bottom level positions, but actually make them naturalists, make them captains, make them managers of camps or, and make them independent of outside people coming to run these camps. Let it be their own in some way or the other. Um, so yeah, that's a brief introduction of who I am, Shabir. That's great. Thanks, Amit. Uh, I'm already eyeing Starbed. Can't wait to get there once the lockdown's over. Yes, please. Um, Great. So uh, we'll move on to our third panelist, which is uh, Rupesh Rai. He's the founder of Green People, and he's formerly worked with Taj Hotels and Thomas Cook in senior roles. Um, as we all know, Uttarakhand is facing a major migration crisis. We have over 1,800 coast villages in Uttarakhand, and Green People has started some amazing initiatives to uh, to sort of tackle this crisis. Um, I've been to, I've spent time at a couple of them, uh, the goat villages at Naftiba and Dayara Bukyal. Uh, and they are two of the most amazing experiences you can have in Uttarakhand. So I, I really um, urge you to check them out when it's possible. Um, and they've also pioneered some interesting models like pay as you like, where a traveler is able to go to a, an accommodation and choose uh, how much they want to pay for it, which is a very bold move in a country like India. Uh, but we'd like to hear more from you, Rupesh. Over to you. Thank you, Shibya. So uh, most of us would have uh, these, uh, you know, vivid memories of uh, Kedarnath catastrophe, uh, you know, close to some uh, 15,000 uh, people, either uh, they got injured or uh, they lost their lives. Uh, and uh, it uh, it almost wiped out an entire city called Rambada and considered the second biggest uh, catastrophe in modern India after tsunami. And uh, I happened to, so I was also like a regular, you know, uh, hotelier um, uh, and uh, as uh, Amit uh, mentioned, you know, Bandha Garkana, so I was associated uh, at one point of time with a project called Taj Safaris, which was a joint venture of Taj and Conservation Corporation of Africa. So I was the, uh, uh, you know, pioneer uh, uh, sort of uh, the, uh, you know, founding team member of uh, uh, that initiative. So the seed of, you know, some amount of that, you know, conservation bit was already, you know, pre-existing. And uh, as a trade observer, uh, you know, I went to Kedarnath to witness, uh, uh, you know, the, the government was doing a lot of initiative for rehabilitation uh, and, you know, just went there to see that, observe that and the amount of uh, dead bodies, course of dead bodies and, uh, you know, dilapidated building, it had a very, uh, uh, you know, strong impact on me. And after coming back for two months, I was unable to come to the terms, you know, uh, normal terms and started reading books about minimalism and sustainability and stuff like that. So that, you know, so one thing so cut short, uh, one thing led to another. And 2016, uh, 2014, we started, I went and lived in a, in a village, which was abandoned some 25 years ago um, on a trekking route. Uh, called Naktibba, somewhere at the midpoint of uh, that trekking route uh, called Naktibba. So 25 years ago, that place was thriving with, uh, you know, agriculture and, and rural life. But then it became deserted over a period of time because the, the new generation was finding, you know, more uh, lucrative option, uh, so to say lucrative option, you know, outside the village. Uh, and we started as a goat cheese project, but that goat cheese project couldn't take off uh, because the goats were not lacting. The goats were not lacting because uh, the there was a gene pool issue. 
so we were to stall that thing and in those goat sheds which were supposedly you know uh, goat sheds we started uh, we spruced them up and uh, uh, you know revived a dying form of architecture called koti banal which is a earth earthquake uh, uh, you know proof 1000 uh, year old technique so that uh, so for good 6 months you know nobody turned up and uh, in desperation we started this campaign called pay what you like and which was covered by some national newspapers etc you know social media post became viral and then we had trickle of people coming in uh, and that followed something called be my volunteer village manager so lot of you know these burnt out uh, uh, you know corporate executives a um, uh, lot of millennials uh, the digital nomads you know we started inviting them on a pro bono basis that come and and run the place the way you want uh, because i tried running it like a typical you know hospitality product and it just uh, didn't work out because uh, and you know the, there was a lot of unlearning which happened uh, uh, on the way so then you know people started coming in and uh, today uh, a place which used to have a footfall of some 1200 people is now having some 90000 people now we are struggling with a different kind of problem that you know how to kind of taper down the the number of people who are coming there but what it did, majority the good part is majority of the people who have that additional footfall which happened uh, are uh, you know they belong to responsible tourism cult and Uh, this uh, you know additional footfall gave birth to 103 new homestays uh, and uh, some 25 uh, somewhat responsible eco you know campsites now when people started coming a good segment of people they were uh, you know chefs coming from uh, you know my sort of you know uh, peer group and they told that these small uh, ma- marginalized farmers what they are growing is is like a you know poor man food is rich man medicine so we will give you support you uh, if you you know uh, ensure the supply then we started collecting from the farmers under the brand called bakri chap so i put it this way in hindi ki bakri so I, uh, you know uh, failed goat cheese ki divangat atma ko shraddhanjali dene ke liye bakri chap namak ek brand ka janm hua and then we started giving market linkage to the uh, you know micro farmer marginalized farmers over there uh now uh you know we are not a real estate operator but you know the wherever we have stepped in the real estate costs uh, you know they increase by uh 5 to 10 times uh, uh without having any uh you know uh nt uh, planet kind of activity you know no no chemical factory no nothing you know no no construction but yet uh you know there is uh, there is a growth uh, in terms of you know economic uh, uh, you know parameters over there so the second Uh, uh the second uh, pit stop was dyara bugyal which is the considered one of the highest alt- altitude meadow of uh, uh you know the uh, lower middle himalaya and we had been recipient of several awards like uh, uh, you know we run without electricity you have to walk for 2 kilometers to reach to uh, you know these goat villages uh, and uh, we had been recipient of uh, the latest uh, world responsible tourism award uh, we and you know quite a few times we got uh, outlook responsible tourism award had been featured in conde nast uh, travel and leisure and through hathpur ki collection uh, we had been uh, uh, on the cover page of whatsapp uh, coffee table book uh, we are the uh, brand ambassadors for facebook and whatsapp for uh, this year uh, we are also one of the sort of you know the core team for uh, the incredible india campaign this year and uh, then uh, we uh, to address that uh, gene pool uh, the you know goat goat issue uh, the the milk issue we started an event called bakri swayambar and we told the villagers uh, the uh, you know benefit of one time settlement over you know so they were rearing goat for culling and meat and all that and we had lot of you know vegan uh, sort of people from that segment coming in so we thought that okay we can't become vegan overnight but we can find a bridge in between so we we went to them and we told that uh, the milk is one you know meat is one time settlement but milk is a recurring income and on that we started we did bakri swember uh, which became a kind of uh, phenomenal success uh, uh, so we did season 2 uh, uh, and uh, now the you know there is a there is a serious awareness uh, in that entire region uh, about uh, importance of livestock and uh, you know the cattle and traditional ways of living 80% of the farm uh, you know farmers are now 
uh, growing indigenous millets and pulses. When we went there, only 20% of them were growing, you know, strains of hybrid wheat and paddy, which is not very pro people and pro planet. So this is what we had been sort of, you know, in a nutshell, we had been doing. Uh, our recent project is bird village. So while the goat village was about uh, migration of humans to their own villages, which they abandoned, they left. Bird village is about uh, doing not so typical wildlife tourism and, you know, focusing on the big mammals like tiger and elephant, which has been done to death. So we'll be focusing on earthworms, frogs, bees, butterflies. So the Chiriagang or bird village is about uh, reverse migration of biodiversity. So this had been our sort of, you know, chronological sort of uh, evolution. And uh, now we have during the pandemic, we started a community called uh, Madhouse to Madhouse. We'll quickly talk about that. I think I'm past my time. So but we'll just quickly run through the slides. Uh, the next one. Uh, Aisha, can you change the slide, please? So this had been sort of, you know, the if you see the outer circle, uh, the goat village, Bakri Chhap, uh, green people uh, is is our uh, the first part of journey five years uh, before pandemic. And during the pandemic, we started a uh, sort of we gave it a shape of entity. Uh, so new tourism brand is hideout and uh, uh, urban community is madhouse to madhouse. It's all, you know, overlapping. While green people, we don't own any asset, any property. We don't believe in, you know, owning a property in rural India. We created a community. We made them sort of uh, self-reliant. And now we are uh, positioning ourselves like a, a pan-India. Uh, so green people was a rural community. Madhouse to Madhouse is an urban community. And they are people, you know, it's a heterogeneous community. They themselves are investor, collaborator, buyer and volunteer and workers. So this is... Uh, a quick sort of snapshot of so there is a uh, overlap reasonable amount of overlap among each other the next one uh, Aisha so you know 6.5 lakhs uh, villages in India every village has got a unique tale to tell every village is on the brink of cultural or agricultural bankruptcy and out of uh, this uh, you know some 60 uh, 4 crore people are farmers and within that 15 crore, uh, close to 15 crore are micro marginalized and small farmers, which is the bottom of the pyramid. So that's our focus area. Our market segment is like tip of the pyramid, but the bottom of the pyramid is where, you know, we are working like a community and we are trying to scale it up uh, uh, rather than, you know, kind of reducing it like an alternative lifestyle choice or, you know, just impacting a very small local ecosystem. So the overall, it's like a 27 lakhs crore sort of, you know, it's, it also makes, uh, uh, you know, the post pandemic, post pandemic, it makes a business sense because it's all about, uh, you know, balancing triple P uh, first comes planet, then comes people and then come profit, but all three are equally important. So it's a, it's a, by that, this thing, you know, if we talk about just nine crore marginalized farmer itself, which is the bottomest of the pyramid. It's a, it's a, uh, you know, 27 lakh crore existing sort of market, which if it is organized, it can, uh, you know, uh, bring some uh, paradigm shift in uh, the way, you know, rural India had been uh, uh, going through that cultural and agricultural bankruptcy. Uh, and our motto is glamorizing the farmers and ruralizing the urbans. I will skip this, uh, you know, interpretation of this particular reverse triangle, uh, maybe for some other time. Uh, the next one, Aisha, uh, we can skip this. Yeah, so I'll just, uh, so this is uh, the impact which we have created. Uh, it talks about this. This is, uh, we call impactometer. Uh, uh, we have sort of our own device terms like impactometer, ISO location. Uh, the next slide. So I'll just uh, uh, show you some pictures. Uh, this was our team, you know, Dilwale Bakariya Le Jayenge. And there was a lot of, you know, uproar. Every Bakri Swamber invited some uh, uh, reasonable, you know, back full of uh, controversies. And and then, you know, later on, everything fell down. So our first time brides were Deepika, Katrina, Priyanka, then Alia, Shraddha, Kangna. Then they were Maya, Mamta, Mehbooba, which couldn't happen due to, uh, you know, COVID. Uh, hopefully this year we will again, uh, you know, organize it. Probably this time it will be Madhya Pradesh we are planning. Uh, the next one. Uh, so this is Dara Bugyal. It is, uh, you know, made from 100% farmed pine wood, uh, uh, you know, very low key, uh, no frill sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, tourism product. The next one. 
this is nagtibba uh, uh this image had been you know they have it has received lot of awards and we till that we have spent zero uh, you know uh, rupee uh, on any kind of you know marketing uh, or advertising activity uh, the next one uh this is again uh, the court village nagtibba this is considered revival of uh, koti banal style of architecture uh the next one this is again uh, uh nagtibba and some of the images of bakri chap aisha you can keep skipping uh, and it is self explanatory and we also do you know campaigns like uh, uh, we hate plastic uh, and we are fantastic uh, we are packaging the bakri chap products now in uh, sterilized uh, uh you know coke and pepsi bottle so we are we are not really a kind of you know activist activist uh, uh, we didn't come from this space we are like a wild card entry into this space so a uh, lot of you know trial and error and hits, uh, hits and trials and we have been you know uh, we have died many deaths in between uh and uh, totally self funded not taken any help from any government organization or any uh, you know institutional funding as such but now we are scaling up so we are focusing on indigenous millets pulses etc and it has its own micro niche most of the five star hotels of uttarakhand they are showcasing our product and using it in the menu uh next one sorry guys for exceeding my time i think yeah thank yeah, you i think yeah all right uh thanks so much rupesh for that uh, detailed uh, introduction to your work uh so i'm going to jump into questions for the panelists now and i see that uh, some of you have already asked some questions in the q and a box uh if you have any questions as we go along please pop them in i'll try to ask them as we go along or after the conversation uh so uh, rupesh mentioned that one of the turning points in his life was the kedarnath tragedy and his witnessing what happened there uh i want to pose that question to you uh, amit and ishita uh, was there a defining moment in your life or in your career that led you down the path to pursue uh, sustainable tourism maybe we can start with amit yeah sure thanks um you know sustainability when you go deep inside the jungles is automatically many of the principles fall in place anyways because you know the people that you employ the people the material that you work with everything becomes local to a larger extent and after i lost my father grandfather and many years of sort of running the business i i just i wanted to go sort of one step beyond and and take inspirations and i traveled the world i was lucky enough to exchange trips with people around the world whether it's africa south america arctic and you know my my passion was wildlife anywhere there was wildlife i was going whether it was uganda or botswana or galapagos or 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 jaguar country in brazil and to see what everybody and had done and i uh, for me it was like what is, how can i cause the least impact on land and i see somebody in the panel also asked the question what do you think about you know the materials used in making a lodge and things like that um uh, if you don't mind shivya i'm not going to keep this long but i'm going to share something here um uh, which i so i went into central india and i went to collect things that i can refurbish that i can reuse while building a camp while causing no impact on land so these doors for example were collected from schools in central india that were getting destroyed so i bought about 24 of these doors from different different places uh, it has that nostalgic almost jodhpur blue look but in central india even in government buildings these doors were used how do you use it the most uh, you know in in a way which looks cool uh, and the idea was to actually be able to make a camp where we we do flooring from it because the wood has been around for 30 40 years and doesn't go bad how do we reuse that how do we use forest rest house chairs and up the caliber and still being make it presentable for guests we re-leather them re-suede them uh so all these friends i went to the graveyard of ships of asia and i bought 20 tons of wood from the flooring of ships in gujarat in alang and i brought them into madhya pradesh and said this wood has been in water for 25 30 years nothing happens to this wood you know dimak nahi lagta all those things don't happen let's do our flooring from it so we created these blocks of eight in every room that every year in end of april the entire room dismantles even the flooring comes out and we go back to nature every may and the, the river stream starts to flow and in october we we remake the camp almost every year these these de writing desks belong to the supreme court of india uh, of 55 60 years old now uh, and i always have a carpenter on call because of that you know this wood was used on a pool deck uh, places like that we started to also use uh, embassy furniture for using sofa so the idea was how do we make an art piece without actually causing any impact on land and reusing a lot of 
elements that are already out there. Uh, of course, we had, we had to rebuild our bed, but beyond that, everything else was actually procured from some way or the other. Uh, even my grandfather's slides, we said they're rotting away. Rather than putting you know, big, big pictures, why don't we display it like art? Uh, and that was the idea that we filled the walls with it. So for us, it was uh, you know, a defining moment. Yes, I wanted to bring design and art together, and I wanted to create a camp which has every principle of sustainability beyond uh, just hiring local, just uh, you know, e e eating farm to table food. That anyways is going to be there, no plastic. Uh, how do we, we give a water bottle as well, you know, when guests arrive, so they refill their water bottles while, while going and we charge a lot of money if you want a bottle of water, you know, there are people who want, we get foreign guests as well, who don't feel safe. And you know what, you pay for it in that case, that you, that pinch should happen to you. But, you know, something like uh, a beer may be free, but the water will cost you money because you're drinking out of a plastic bottle. That, that was the idea. So putting all those things in place, and, and these were inspirations that I took from around the world to sort of say, hey, how can we make the most sustainable place uh, uh, where there is no impact on land? Leopards and tigers take over every year. We have camera traps filled with them uh, you know, around the camp. They started to even cross at nighttime while plants are sleeping. And you know, if you pop out of your tent, there are amazing sightings that you're having. And this was the least impact on land. I grew up in an era where it took 20 hours to get to a remote jungle. Kana, Bandagar, in those times from Delhi used to take 20, 20 hours to get to. Uh, elephants used to come to our room and pick us up and there was no gate to the park. I mean, there was a gate to the park, but there was no, like, this is the time you will go this way and you would just head into the jungle. How do we go back to that era where time had stopped, you know, where you actually enjoyed every moment of it? And putting all those sort of inspirations together, I said, I will make something where there is nobody else. And I will, you know, it's okay. Let, let people drive in another hour to come to somewhere where there is just a peaceful place that they can enjoy wilderness in its raw form. Uh, it's my short answer there. That's amazing. And those visuals were amazing as well. I'm sure a lot of us have got it on our bucket list now. Um, Ishita, I'll ask you that same question. Was there a defining moment in your life or career that led you on this path? I think Shivya, my first, uh, you know, insight into, you know, the negatives of tourism and how tourism was developing in certain hill areas was uh, I did a master's dissertation. I mean, that was donkeys of years ago, but that's what really, you know, opened my eyes. And in my own backyard in Gangotri, you know, I'd done a lot of treks in the wilderness there and, uh, you know, to go and see the impact of mass tourism in the in an ecologically fragile area like Gangotri and Gomuk, where the number of people that visit that was really an eye opener for me. And I remember, you know, asking one of the one of the travelers that was there, you know, it, it, the whole area was strewn with uh, garbage, you know, that the pilgrims had left behind and she was sitting perched up on a rock. And I said, does it bother you that there's so much of garbage around? And, uh, you know, she looked really surprised. And for the first time, it seemed that she was actually noticing the garbage, you know, and she was like, oh, you know, this is just part of our culture. You know, we are used, I mean, this, is, this is normal. And for me, that was even a bigger shock because I was like, oh, like you know, this is part of our culture. We just, we just so used to seeing garbage everywhere that it doesn't really affect us. We're not, I mean, at least in our generation, we were not taught not to throw garbage here and there. You know, it was just a normal thing to see garbage strewn all over the mountainsides and just throw it out of your window and just, uh, you know, and, and that's what we've grown up with. So I think that for me was, you know, a really eye opener. And I think that's what uh, then later inspired me to do what I do, you know, to look at how we could, you know, uh, develop tourism in a way that, you know, you could negate some of these negative impacts. You can't get rid of them totally, but you can try and minimize them. So I think that was a defining moment. So I have a follow-up question for you then. Um, of course, uh, you know, like Spiti is uh, a much more remote, you know, place than, than many places in Uttarakhand, uh, considering how long it takes to get there and what a treacherous journey it is. Uh, but also Spiti is changing over time. Like I remember when I first visited in 2010, um, I, was, I was actually shocked to think that such a pristine place could exist in India and all the work that you had been doing there. Uh, but then when I visited in 2017, there had been an influx of, you know, like a lot of travel agencies and people offering much cheaper tours. Um, so as an organization, uh, you, you can go into a destination and set up something that's, you know, very responsible. But what happens when, um, when it sort of becomes, you know, a bit more mass and 
you know, people start demanding uh, cheaper travel and travel that may not necessarily be environmentally friendly and community friendly. Uh, what kind of impact do you think that's happening on Spiti and where does where do we go from here? Ishita, are you there? Okay, I think well, so I'm Sorry, I think my uh, internet was a bit unstable, but I get the gist of what you're asking. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, things have changed a lot in Spiti over the years with a larger number of tour tourists coming in. Definitely, uh, you know, incomes for local communities has increased to a lot, large extent, but there is the, you know, the obvious negatives, which, you know, so, I mean, I think from what I understand from your question is that, uh, you know, what can one do about it, right? So I think, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a role that everyone has to play and eventually it just boils down to choices, you know? So, I mean, you could be working as a responsible travel company, but you need the traveler also, you know, to be a responsible traveler, you know, to make the right choices. And likewise, you also need, you know, the, the relevant kind of like norms in place as well. So the government also plays a huge role in this entire aspect, you know? So I think like everything, everything is interdependent and everything is kind of like uh, correlated and for really a place to become a responsible travel destination or sustainable travel for that matter, it all has to work in tandem. You know, you're, you can't do it in isolation, like just as a company. Yes, you are there, you're providing a choice to a traveler. So a traveler does have the ability to, you know, take that choice. But eventually it's all about, uh, you know, working in tandem with everybody and, you know, kind, kind of like coming onto the same page to really make an impact at a destination level. Okay, fair enough. Can I just contribute so, to that, Shivya, as well? Yeah, just for sure. up, Following up from that, even in Central India, I mean, it is the, the travelers you may get of all different types, you know, they may or may not care for the environment, uh, sustainability, but still the government doesn't play its part. You know, it, it's by sensitizing the traveler in their campaigns, rather than doing mass tourism, actually recognizing the value of a village, a community, a wildlife destination, or whatever it is, Till there are not rules around building how you do tourism in a particular area. I mean, that, that, is, that is a constant battle we face. I may go to an, a remote area and set up a camp, but tomorrow if there's, you know, somebody sees my success and builds 20 more, is that the right thing to do? Or maybe go to a completely different area and do something new and innovate it. Uh, you know, innovation can come from entrepreneurs, you know, and, and no problem. And they, I think the younger generation anyways is way more conscious on how they build, what they do, what the impact they cause on the land and how it affects the people that we're going to. But is at the policy level, you know, it is, it is defined in such a way like eco-sensitive zones. Uh, you know, what is the impact that you're calling? I, are there punishments for people who are polluting the areas that we are going to? Not the travelers only. I mean, travelers, we have to, in a way, police, unfortunately, uh, to a certain extent. There will be many amazing travelers, for sure. Uh, but yes, I mean, the, all levels have to synchronize the traveler, the government, the policymaking, and the entrepreneur level, absolutely, uh, to make it you know, make it successful at the end of the day. Yeah, and that's a that's a bit of an ask, like, uh, especially in the last few years, uh, you know, in India. But I want to take this uh, question also to Rupesh, where, you know, when you started out in the Naktibha area, I think you were the only one, like the Court Village was the only one. And like you mentioned, it's grown to so many more homestays and the footfalls increased by lakhs of travelers. Um, so what do you think are like the positive and negative impacts on the community? And we also have a question from the audience where someone wants to know, how did you win the trust of the community in the first place to be working so closely with them? Uh, well, Shibya, uh, when we when we started, uh, there was a rumor in the village that, uh, you know, the guys who have set up their camp on that, uh, you know, top of that thati is uh, they are some uh, kidney chore gang, you know, don't go there. So for good first uh, you know, almost two months we were struggling to get the masons and workers coming in and working with us. So we were to get some people from Uttar Kashi to start, you know, working for us. The locals didn't support. But then we, you know, one person came, then, uh, you know, that, that was followed by some other person and uh, uh, some other people. And that, that chain continued. And what I realized that uh, at the end, what works is uh, the, for villagers, uh, it is, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, they feel that they are 
uh, you know they are not leading uh, the you know everything is uh, all the you know glamour glitter is in the city and they are uh, they they believe that you know they are down market so we we thought that we have to create some theater of uh, or some test tube baby of some set, kind of setup which can make them feel that what they are doing is sexy so initially uh, we were uh, you know the locals were not ready to work in their own farm but when the volunteers started and they started working in the farm then that started having uh, the rub off effect so we felt that uh, the it's not lack of the opportunities but it's it's lack of self esteem and higher the altitude remoter the uh, place uh, lower the self esteem so you know all you know all the colonially uh, you know uh, ruled countries they have the you know self esteem issue a city person probably will have a self esteem index 9 out of 10 if you're st studying in you know stephen uh, or or you know some uh, uh, lsr or something but if you you would aspire to go to harvard but someone who's living in nagtibba his superior cousin is in uh masuri uh, his self esteem index would be 6 or 7 out of 10 masuri will have a superior cousin living in dehradun or delhi or bombay so this is a vicious cycle so we thought that we have to do more of uh, you, we have to create those uh, you know setups those test tube babies and we have to fake it till we make it and then gradually uh, you know they started uh, uh, you know believing into it they saw that it's a economic model they saw that it's a, it's a business model so when they believed that it's a business model then whatever we told them they believed but you know before that uh, uh, uttarakhand government has spent 20000 crores on uh, in last 20 years 10th chief minister they have spent 20000 crores on reverse migration projects but they have not succeeded because they started they wanted to work in a uh, you know a very classroom model or a workshop model so we have to set up some theaters uh, some some theaters which eventually people you know uh, embody when it becomes contagious so this is uh, you know uh, our take and what we you know what amit was saying that it's very difficult to sort of uh, uh, do anything unless there is a policy level intervention yes i agree the reason uh, being that most of the people who are operating in this space you know the, the who care for planet and people they are fragmented they are intellectually arrogant and they are fragmented they don't collaborate they don't scale up it's not it, it is not scalable that's what we are trying to address to madhouse to madhouse so we uh, the, unless you you form a consortia any every sector every industry which is damaging the planet you know be it real estate or chemical or anything you know they have their own lobbies they have their own consortia they have their own syndicates to intervene at the policy level that's where we lack because we don't have a you know strong body with a strong will power because it's not a profitable business so unless it has been positioned as a profitable business unless there is a syndicate unless there is a consortia of such people strong willed people you will not be able to intervene at a policy level and yes without intervening at a policy level it can't sort of you know see the light of the day so uh, yeah and and the activism is a sort of thing of past you know it is it is not going to kind of you know uh, lead us to save planet and people So, Ishita, I want to take uh, this question to you. Then, uh, have you faced similar challenges working with the community in Spiti? And um, like, what, what has been your biggest challenge convincing travelers to to pick Ecosphere over, let's say, cheaper offerings in the valley? Uh, Shivya, that that is a challenge. That is tourism uh, by its nature is a is competitive, like any business, right? So, I mean, when we do at one hand try and balance uh, fair prices and activities, you know, they all have an expense. But a traveler is usually looking for something that is cheapest. You know, uh, not all travelers. There are, of course, you know, travelers who are looking for the experience and willing to spend the extra bit. But that percentage of traveler is very very small. so so yeah so i mean um, that that is the challenge for us of course you know to uh, you know to to find those travelers uh, on the other hand the other question of yours was uh, about can you hear me i think uh, yeah yeah 
yeah the other question of yours was the uh, if any we faced any challenges at ecosphere what we've done is that you know we've uh, uh, from the start we've incorporated the local community as part of the ownership of ecosphere so ecosphere is owned by the local community so that in itself is you know uh, you know where the community that gets involved more uh, you know actively hence that's been our strategy all of our staff is local as well so a lot of uh, tourism operations or hospitality sector they bring in people from outside you know who already who already working in the travel sector but we uh, shied away from that approach we because i mean the whole idea was to build local capacities so right from the guides who didn't even know english properly we've trained them right from scratch in everything you know they they were just local villagers who you know basically knew a lot about their local area but they weren't able to necessarily you know communicate with the traveler homestays who had no clue how to host anybody we've trained everybody from scratch so that they could take on these skills and then manage uh, you know the tourism uh, industry uh, manage travelers coming into the area so so that's i mean so we we didn't really face uh, many challenges as such you know when it came to tourism and uh, the local community okay that's that's good to get that perspective of you know two very different communities and i think amit uh, maybe your experience was similar to ishita's as well where uh, i mean you talked in your initial presentation about you know making the community kind of have that onus of the place itself uh, so i want to ask a question that's on everyone's mind and i've seen it pop in the chat box a couple of times which is that uh, right now we're in the second of uh, we're in the middle of the second wave and covid-19 has pretty much decimated the tourism industry a second year in a row uh, so how have your respective businesses coped with that and um, do you think when we bounce back from this will there be a renewed consciousness both among travelers and the tourism industry are we really going to build back better um, anyone who wants to answer that question first maybe amit Yeah sure I mean we were really scared when September came around last year uh, that you know if we don't open the camps we have you know about 65 employees between the three camps what do we start doing I mean it it makes it has to make financial sense so, sort of for everybody and we can put out of our pockets we can break our fixed deposits for so long but there is a limit to what we can do at the end of the day and um to be frankly honest just because kana bandagar uh, you know and pench being those popular areas it did flock a lot with domestic tourism and a sector that we didn't recognize or market to in ages and people started to come from every small town you can imagine in madhya pradesh you know they were very limited that came from bombay and delhi uh, at that point even the flights were operating but then looking at you know second tier third tier even fourth tier cities so you know raipur or or sub now and 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 these people generally go abroad for their travel so they've started to now are these people sensitized to the area that they're going to is the next big question uh because you know what 75% of the people didn't even go on a safari uh all they wanted was to get out of their lockdown in their houses and actually be in nature the idea of being in nature was the most attractive thing whether it was for one night or two nights and just being able to breathe outside and actually move away from the pandemic stress that you know as they called it all this time and and it came all the way around to january february uh, and then of course march by mid march we shut all our camps down just the wave of the pandemic took up the initial worry was that there are thousands and thousands of people employed directly and indirectly through tourism whether it's the guides at the gate you know whether it's about the government because they they are not permanent employees they get every time they go into the park they get revenue the jeep drivers who tra- uh, drive inside the park everybody saw business you know uh, and you know i i i don't, I don't want to say any soft stories because there weren't that many soft stories everybody that we talked to is drivers and, and, and guides just because the domestic tourism flowed so strongly because these people could not go outside they were all employed through all the way till mid march yes you know everybody's had a salary cut and not not making any money since mid march but by uh, april may we anyway start to sort of wind down and shut down our camps so you know it is a there, there is a two fold answer here it was Yes, everybody got jobs. Everybody got, everybody got employed, and you know what? The biggest fear usually happens is people when they don't see an income, you know, then starts bush meat, then starts poaching, then starts all these things because there is no revenue at all because of desperation. And we saw that even when the migrant crisis happened last year, that they were going into the villages and villages weren't allowing people in from Delhi, these migrant workers, and there was a rise in bush meat hunting, you know, because how will they eat? you know anything in the jungle that they could find that's what was happening 
all those fears were there that has sort of gone away just because there was actually a tourism season. And secondly, do we now worry that because of all this, there is going to be massive over-tourism coming, you know, even in the next year when this wave ends and when October comes around and India does not open to international travel to a certain extent, are we going to see this massive, you know, Indians tra travel through all throughout the country, uh, whether it's remote region? And we are technically a remote region in Kana Bandhaka. We don't sit next to Delhi, Jaipur or, uh, you know, Bombay for that matter. It's not drivable from the big cities. And these are all travelers from these other cities. Yes, Delhi, Bombay people will also come. But is that going to now reach a level where over tourism, where all lodges are full? We may be happy, but is the impact on land going to be positive or we need to sensitize that traveler? And I see this question also popping up in, in, in chess that is the new traveler going to be more sensitive? Is it going to be more responsible traveler after coming out of the pandemic? You know, after all these changes and have we actually gotten up and realized what we have done to the world? You know, is the main question. Uh, Sadly, I say no, uh, you know, to a, a large extent. Yes, there are, is a new breed of traveler, which is definitely going to be more conscious, more aware of where they go, more impact of what happens on the land. But to a greater majority, there's still weekend holidays that are coming. And then the, the, the education is very limited. And again, that also has to be sort of policy level. We may do as much as we can. We can put all the flyers in place and we can do it all in our marketing that come to a place, disconnect, you know, leave the TV at home, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, is the demand for that there? Uh, yes, absolutely. There's no question about it. But then there is, you know, many other people who come and see the opportunity. Wow, there's so much tourism. Let's build a hundred hotels in Bangladesh. And it will happen. It's bound to happen if we don't have policy. You know, let's build 200 open uh, hotels and uh, rooms in uh, more in Ranthambore, which already has probably a thousand, you know, thousands of rooms already in that place. Is Till that doesn't happen, eco-sensitive zones don't get created. This policy level is the only thing that will stop it. Because human nature is to, you know, succeed. You know, oh, that place is doing well. What potential? Let's make another 50 rooms. And that's going to happen, I mean, sadly, in both Ishita and Rupesh's area, I feel that people will see business and there'll be everything from a tour operator competition level to a hotel level. To, let's sell this for cheap. How much cheaper can you give it to me? And that unfortunately drives, you know, the destination. And that's where destinations get ruined. Uh, but but the question is, Amit, like we're, we're talking about, I think, 2019 statistics, which said that we had 1.8 billion domestic tourist trips. So at that scale, do you think sustainable tourism is even, you know, like practically possible? Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, if it's done on policy level, why not? Tomorrow, if you say, for example, in Spiti or anywhere else on the policy level, it comes and say that these are the principles that you will build on. You know, you will... you. Uh, you know, you have to do all these practices, water management, you know, uh, try for solar electric, all those other things. If, if the government sort of puts that in place, you will not build two kilometers from a national park, for example, or a core area for national. And if you do, it's OK, but just make sure that you are hand in hand with the community when you do it, that you, the place you make only can have that many rooms, cannot have 100 rooms for that matter. Please do not add concrete walls throughout the whole place. You know, because once you do that, you're anyways destroying corridors while doing it. So can that happen or not? It's up to us to drive it. You know, it's up to policy level to drive. I can't drive it as a private interview. I've tried, you know, I've tried in many areas. But can we drive it in such a way? In, in Snow Leopard country, you know, Snow Leopard tourism blew our proportion about five, six years ago. And when we used to camp about nine, ten years ago in, in, in different valleys in Husing and Rumbak, you know, we, there was a time I counted, you know, as many as 55 to 60 tents in one area where when I started just about 12 years ago, not that long ago, there were only five tents. So it went in a national park. You can do that. They will try to control it within the national park. But then there were other examples that happened, whether it was in Kibber or whether it was in Ule, where the community lodge got set up uh, at 10 or 11 rooms and nobody else could actually come into that area because the, the entire community is benefiting from it. And once the entire, why does this happen? When a villager sees another villager saying, Wo to acha kar ra. I mean, that person is doing well. Why am I not doing well? That's always the question. And, and this success will drive people to make, you know, if everybody benefits from a project, then they don't, there is no reason for them to look for, to make major investments and bring in outside people and sell their lands to it.
I mean, we can't control that. If villages tomorrow go and sell all their lands to, to corporates of, or throughout the country, then it'll be concrete almost everywhere in the country. We're already losing land to, you know, highways and all this other stuff that's coming up by the government. But who are we to deny development to the villagers? I mean, that's also another question. Why should we stop electricity from going to remote villages? They have every right to have it at the end of the day. But can we save, in my case, save tigers in pockets? And that's what's happening in Madhya Pradesh. You know, the, the Kana Penj corridor, unfortunately, has a six to eight lane highway running through it. There's no way to, and when the judge made a, a, a statement on it, said, we, it cannot come at the development of the people, but we will save tigers in pockets. And that's what's happening. I mean, tigers are expanded. But are we benefiting the communities around it? Because if we don't, then they will sell their lands for lakhs and crores and whatever it is. And suddenly, you know, it'll become uh, concrete everywhere. But we are still not late. I think we are still there. I think still we can do it. It's just we need good people who make policy, who understand that. Uh, Sorry, I know I'm taking yeah. a lot of the time. I'll yeah, let other fair enough. Speak. I think there's a ray of hope there. And Ishta, do you share that hope? Or do you think it's, uh, do you think uh, we're going to come back with a renewed consciousness? See, Shivya, I mean, we've been in lockdown. I mean, to, uh, Spiti is uh, slightly different. I mean, uh, I think Amit still managed to get in a little bit of revenue coming in this year from tourism, fortunately. But Spiti, we've had no tourism from October 19. You know, that's when our leasons, a lean season starts. And as soon as, uh, you know, 2020 happened and everything got closed down. And then this year again, I think a lot of people in Spiti had the hopes that travel would, you know, pick up and they would be able to earn some revenue from that. But again, so I mean, uh, that, that's from the perspective of local communities there. And also, if you look at it in terms of a traveler, he's been holed up almost for a year and a half, you know, hasn't been able to travel freely. So I think... Once, you know, there is some level of normalcy which might emerge in a few months, uh, I think people are going to want to travel a lot. But we also need to understand that everyone has lost a lot of money. People have had salary cuts. People have lost their jobs. So they're definitely going to want to travel budget, you know, a, last, a large majority of them. And um, I, I mean, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but practically, I don't know how many people will actually look at, you know, sustainable travel and travel responsibly and, you know, things like that. I think people are just looking to get out now, you know. So while I hope that uh, people do make choices like that, you know, and there'll still be that bunch of traveler that does, uh, you know, make these choices. So I hope that they would continue making those kind of choices. In terms of what Amit said, in terms of policy, I totally agree with him. You know, you can be a standalone hotel or a resort or a A responsible travel company that tries to follow but unless there are some norms in place and there is i mean in india the danda works you know like you know unless there is a rule that you have to build in a particular way you know that you have to follow certain norms you cannot throw your garbage you have to provide filtered water you know like ban plastic bottles but then provide an alternative you know so i mean at, at large scale level like this, you know, this is where the government has to intervene. But I mean, most of our government sector, most of uh, if you speak to uh, any of the government sector, tourism people, it's all about mass tourism. How can we increase numbers of travelers coming to a destination for that? For them, that's what is tourism, you know, but they don't they don't really take into consideration the impact that it has on an area. So, yeah, so I, I strongly agree with Amit. I think there has to be some level of, uh, you know, working together and the government has to step in. But again, the government might make a norm, but then, you know, it's so easy in our country to not follow those norms. So, <laughs> over to you. All right. So I think, uh, I think Rupesh, we're running a little low on inspiration here. So instead of asking you this question, I'm going to ask you, is there... Is there a sustainable tourism initiative in India or somewhere else in the world that has personally inspired you? And I'm going to ask that question to Ishita and Amit as well, so we can sort of conclude on a more positive note. You're on mute, Rupesh. Yes, Bhutan is uh, one ideal example. You know, they have started, uh, they put a, a per person sort of, you know, cover charge entering into the country. And that has 
help them that's the only carbon uh, uh, you know negative uh, this thing you know they give more carbon oxygen than what they sort of generate as a carbon so that that, that is bhutan is the the most ideal model why it is ideal model because there is a kind of monarchy and the uh, there is a there is a you know the the rulers they have that kind of you know will power so unless there is a policy level intervention we are trying to cure uh, you know cancer with bandages uh and uh, you small little pockets there could be some short lived uh, you know stories of inspiration but uh, or or there is some kind of moment where you know some some magic happens and everyone integrates and you know and they become kind of you know they they force their way to you know their policy making but if that that does not happen as as i said you know lot of you know we, we are high on intellect but fragmented so that is where it is it, it seems less likely so bhutan is definitely one inspiration and uh, 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 you know the the mass market tourism the largely what you said some 10 point something whatever number you told the domestic the large portion of it is pilgrim the pilgrim tourism is the worst of all uh, you know the whole char kedarnath catastrophe was the outcome of that 15000 so called 15000 crore industry which made lot of villages do the regional migration because uh they were getting big, they became victim of easy money so they lost relationship with their soil so as long as and it's a human nature uh, you know uh, people who are sitting at the top of pyramid of evolution they are sensitive enough but those who are at the bottom they will always uh, you know compete with each other and they will aspire to live a life which you are living so uh, which which the people in the cities are living which affluent people are living so unless uh, there is a there is a policy level intervention i don't think that there is a uh, you know uh, or or some miracle where everyone sort of you know joins hand together yeah. these are sort of i i wish there was also someone from uttarakhand tourism hearing you out here sorry i i wish there's someone from uttarakhand tourism hearing you out here among the participants yeah But, i mean yeah. some of these states have taken some initiative like you know kerala uh, to to a reasonable extent you know kerala is uh you know they have that sort of vision so the people at the policy level uh, they don't have that vision you know they are into the politics of uh, uh, you know appeasement and uh, and that's where it falls down yeah today you go to a village remote village and you tell them okay you are starting a sustainable tourism project and a politician comes and he he tells ki he is going to make a kind of you know dam over there and everybody will is going to get more uh, you know wages uh, they will switch the loyalty in no time I hope that's not true for all villages. But I want to ask this question to Amit. Then, uh, trying to get the inspiration high among the audience and among all of us, uh, what is the sustainable tourism initiative that has inspired you? Uh, I mean, generally in India, I when I initially started doing this work, I, I took inspirations from people like you know Raj at Health Tourism, for example. They work in the Northeast mostly, and, and they've done amazing work. Uh, and and uh, Rupesh mentioned Kerala is definitely a, a very bright example of what they're doing. Everything right in tourism. I mean, they are definitely when we look at India pioneers and in, in at least having a vision. And there are many people within Kerala. Uh, my friend Gopi, who owns Blue Yonder, does amazing work there, uh, saving River Nila. That's that's how we started out. We started getting getting involved uh, in snow leopard tourism about ten odd years ago, and I saw Snow Leopard Conservancy do amazing work. You know, in setting up in all these villages where there was no income in the winter. You know, where snow leopard, you know, killing a snow leopard could have been an answer because it took its yak because there was no income and and that human animal conflict was happening. They set up these sort of uh homestays uh which became uh, and by policy by default nobody can really build in a lot of the remote areas of ladakh which is a great thing uh that that came around there hence these sort of homestays started to do well even during the winter and we do see a big positive out of it at the end of the human animal conflict has definitely gone down and i speak more by the human animal conflict side of things uh to a large extent and just by that just by tourism numbers we have been labeled to lobby about 45000 in the last 3 years just from tourism dollars going into snow leopard conservancy beyond the revenue that goes into the home space into the lodges and all this money has gone towards sensitization of people towards human animal conflict through monks through buddhism through all these different camps that one has organized uh so definitely when when looking at india that that is a you know all these are inspirations that i take on what positive Uh, outcomes can happen from tourism. Okay, okay that's great. And Ishita, do you have an example to share as well? 
I think Rupesh and Amit have really covered everything. But yeah, I was going to mention uh, Bhutan has always been a model I've looked up to. You know, in terms of how they manage it there. And uh, but like rightly said, you know, it's because of the monarchy, and kind of like he, you know, decides at a policy level this is going to happen and this is how it's going to happen. So I think that is one of the key, you know, aspects which we could learn from. And definitely, I mean, our entire tourism uh, initiative back in. you know the early 2000s started with snow leopard conservancy and the homestay program so yes that was an inspiration for us and we literally like you know replicated their model with their help in spiti so so yeah so these people and the others like uh, you know amit has mentioned our people raj and uh, gopi there's a you know there's another raj in nepal from social tours and he they're doing amazing stuff as well so i think yeah the, the community is quite small and uh, you know it's it's inspiration that you gather in bits and pieces from everybody and then try and see how you can adapt or build upon that in your own area yeah so so, so i want to bounce one more question uh, we have a lot of interesting questions from the audience but i just want to hear one tip from each of you on uh, on travelers in the audience today which i think is everyone uh, what is your one tip for someone who wants to travel more sustainably or more responsibly just one tip each Rupesh, do you want to go first? Uh, uh, you know, I will sort of repeat that standard cliche that uh, um, you know, leave only footprint, carry only memories. Uh, don't sort of be a tourist, be a traveler. Uh, you know that for me, that's like a mantra that sums it all. And uh, anything, and don't don't sort of you know go for destination hopping. Go to a place and stay there for longer. uh rather than uh, you know distributing your stay uh, in sort of you know various different locations uh, or or you know uh, try to club your number of nights which you have kind of allocated for your holiday uh, that way you will be able to have more immersive experience and you will be you will generate lesser carbon and you will be able to kind of take as well as you know give to the community uh, and take in terms of experiences and uh, uh, give to the community so that's my you know take uh, uh, you know and follow that reduce uh, reuse uh, recycle okay, principle that's, that's uh, more than one tip <laughs> okay great so yeah i think slow travel is great because also a lot of people are working from home and you can just take your work somewhere in one place and actually you know become part of a community there uh, amit what's your one tip just one just one tip uh, well of course uh, embrace slow travel do your homework that's all i say do your homework study the place that you're going to and the impact that you're causing and whether there is a sort of a certification or say do they talk about sustainable tourism at all on their website is that even a consideration for them at the end of the day um so definitely you know embrace those things and teach your children young teach them now you know only then they will learn you know and and don't go for these one night two nighters spend the three four days if you can and actually let them take it in i, I won't that's my perfect ishita your one tip i think my one tip would be like you know if we um is to be mindful when we travel you know i think if uh, if we travel in a way that when we travel to you know say somebody's house as a guest we are very mindful about how we are in that location in that person's house you know so i think if we really want to truly embody you know the the quote the india incredible india quote which is atithi deva bhava you know i think the onus lies on both the host and the traveler here you know atithi deva bhava you know so we treat our our host as uh, you know the host treats the the traveler as a as a god you know but then the traveler also needs to behave like a god right humble and uh, you know with as less of a footprint as possible leaving behind as much as they can you know for the for the place that you visit so i think uh, yeah Uh, that would that be my amazing. thing to be I, mindful I, I, I about uh, how we behave, how we travel. Ishita, I was going to say you should maybe come up with another slogan uh, instead of "Ati Tiru Deva Bhava," doing the reverse for the traveler. It's like you better respect where you go to, you know, in a way. Yeah, I wonder what that would sound like if you flipped it around. Uh, but we're going to take some questions from the audience now. So the first question is from Maya Rao, uh, and she asks, uh, "What steps are needed to sensitize travelers to minimalistic consumption?" is it a school level intervention do we collaborate with education stakeholders ngos etc um amit would you like to answer that 
uh, sorry, the question was to sensitize traveler at the at the school level. That's yeah, what you're like is that uh, can we collaborate with educational institutions to sensitize travelers at a younger age, or how do we go about Absol it? A absolutely, and there's countless organizations out there, and depending on what the interest is in my field, for example, become a part of Sanctuary Cub. You know, Sanctuary Asia magazine does an amazing thing linking all uh, children together from around India about conservation, about community, about rewilding, about doing all those things. So definitely, you know, tie up with, uh, tie up with, uh, yes, we have it in our books. We learn about it. We read on the internet. But it's very different when it's coming from passionate people who are actually involved in the field. And get them to come and talk to you because it is important and they'll do it for free. There is no charge to doing this. You know, it's all out there. They, they all get funding of some sort or the other to try to make the world a better place. Then get involved with the, the, the cause that you are so passionate about as a teacher, as an educator, as a parent, uh, and get them into the schools because catch them young is the, is the future. I mean, if we teach them now, only then they will be sensitized for the future. Okay, I'm going to throw the next question to Ishita. Uh, do you have any tips for setting up a career in sustainable tourism? What would be the first step? Well, uh, you know, tips in sustainable tourism, I mean, if you're looking at kind of like rural based tourism, then, you know, the, the tip would be to go immediately, uh, you know, to the destination that you want to and really get a sense of, uh, you know, uh, of what could be done there and uh, working alongside with the lo local community, ideally, you know, that would be my tip in terms of if you want to set up, uh, you know, sustain sustainable tourism, uh, you know, like a company or an organization. Okay, that's, it's package, but it's good. Um, I'm going to ask Rupesh the next question. Uh, how can we further develop our tourism infrastructure to inculcate the values of sustainability? Since since that's something that has been pioneered at Goat Village, uh, like how can we do that on a bigger scale? Uh, so I am not, a, though we kind of, you know, uh, did a greenfield project in uh, both uh, Deara and Nagdipa, uh, I personally feel that, you know, I learned that, you know, you don't need to create any infrastructure. You need to create stories. Uh, you need to sort of uh, sensitize the local communities. And there, is, there are enough inventory which is pre-existing. You know, it's high time we just sort of, you know, spruce up, uh, uh, reposition and repurpose those existing inventories. So we, in terms of accommodation, we really have enough. We have enough, uh, uh, you know, the, the hardware uh, per se. Uh, existing if we are talking about sustainable tourism you know we don't need to stress the resources further uh, but yes we need to sort of you know uh, spend uh, uh, our effort time and energy on uh, training the local communities sensitizing them and uh, uh, instead of you know if you talk about infrastructure uh, what is happening right now the current trend is that 90 percent of the uh, you know the collective funds are being spent on uh, destination, uh, you know, infrastructure development or destination uh, promotion. Only 10% is spent on protection. So reverse the equation, you know, spend 90% on protection and only 10% on infrastructure development. Uh, you know, that's my take on if we really talk about a staunch sort of, you know, uh, route of uh, uh, sustainable tourism. Uh, so um, I'm in a way anti infrastructure uh, at this point of time. For good reason. Uh, so I, uh, there's a question from someone uh, who's, I, I think I'll post this to all of you, which is, uh, how are your organizations trying to work with the government to sort of uh, impact some of these policy level changes that we've been talking about throughout this conversation? I mean, is that something that the organization is pursuing or do you think it can be pursued? Uh, Rupesh, do you want to go first and then I'll... Yeah, uh, so we did this Bakri Swayambar was something, you know, which one we wanted to, we have sent a very strong message to the governments, state governments uh, that uh, the uh, the destinations are driven by, you know, focus on event, create events, you know, uh, magnify and amplify your dying form of events. Uh, the, uh, you know, that is going to kind of, you know, do bring tourism to you rather than uh, the typical, uh, you know, the what, what you're doing as a promotion, for example, Madhya Pradesh, they had been doing this tiger promotion to death, you know, for, for donkey's years, tiger has become a poster boy of MP tourism. And what it has done, it has overshadowed uh, the cultural aspect of Madhya Pradesh, uh, the, uh, the other, you know, uh, heritage aspects of Madhya Pradesh. So, uh, so, 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 so this is where, you know, we need to kind of 
uh, use our own tools and techniques or whatever you know it takes uh, to to tell government that so what bakri swamber did now now government has understood it and they are now coming up with certain festivals like ghasiari festival which is like a competition of grass cutting you know the village women folk will be competing and it was a pre existing so bakri swamber was like a test tube baby of an event but there are a lot of other indigenous authentic events you know which needs to be promoted so instead of uh, we really need to put our might together to you know go to government and tell them that you know promote these stories promote the events uh, don't promote anything which is tangible in nature uh, uh, and we are doing our share you know not at a very large scale but yes whatever little circle of influence we have you know we are also inviting lot of young bureaucrats from lal bahadur shastri academy to come and volunteer with us on certain projects so something called desi incubator we have uh, which is like uh, we are working on lot of you know pro planet pro people kind of you know not necessarily tourism but other sustainable projects so uh, this is what is my take yeah. great ishita what about you so we have worked uh, you know alongside the government and in fact there have been a number of dialogues as well you know with the bureaucracy how uh, well, like i mentioned earlier as well i mean in a, a lot to do is with uh, you know unfortunately with the government how it works it all depends on who the bureaucrat is there at that particular point in time you know if they have a mindset where you know they would want to bring about a change uh, you know they would but like uh, i mean the what i quoted earlier you know about like for tourism or uh, you know especially like the bureaucrats you know was that uh, tourism is about numbers you know so this this is a direct uh, outcome of uh, a talk that we had with uh, you know the tourism secretary of himachal pradesh at that point in time you know and uh, she was like uh, you know how can you tell me that uh, you know that uh, there are certain uh, impacts of tourism i know but all my uh, hoteliers and tour operators come to me to just say increase tourism numbers increase tourism numbers you know and uh, so yeah so i mean while there has been an effort and uh, through the numerous projects as well that we work on in spiti uh, there is a need for you know some sort of like a, a higher level pressure to kind of like change uh, or tip the policies in a certain way so i guess the goal of the policies has to be defined before we even get into the policies which is not tourism numbers but really you know the impact of tourism and whether that's positive or not i guess um amit what about you i mean same thing you should have said the change with the changing governments every time you know every time every 2 3 years you're lobbying the same different minister doing different things so i've start, i've stopped lobbying i think uh, mp tourism as per se because i mean they they've been quite good but yes he europesh is completely right tiger tourism to death you know absolutely tiger chasing uh, out tiger deco types you know campaigns that they're doing but i think for us the argument is more the sensitization is more working to with the forest department more than the tourism department because in the areas that we work with they need to come up with a policy and if one can't go into the park then that limited how many lodges can be built they are the ones who can actually come out with policy and things like that and we 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 are constantly you know every year there is some talks and stuff like that happens group meetings happens trying to understand the thing naturally there's a lot of pressure to go from the jeep system in in madhya pradesh which is unique to madhya pradesh compared to rajasthan that let's put the canters in 20 seater 30 seater 10 seater and th- that those are things we fight within our own organizations you know our private entrepreneurship of tourism organizations all the time we don't want that you know once that comes in it's like when the supreme court came in and said only these many vehicles can go in particular zones and areas i thought it was a great thing that they have finally limited the numbers and those 50 60 100 jeeps standing on one tiger will slowly you know go away and it has to a large extent it has where only certain you have to wake up and book a ticket two months three months four months in advance in order to go to the park it needs to be a prized pos- uh, possession it cannot be chalo kal tiger dekhte hain you know it can't be a picnic you know at the end of the day we need to control it by that and they they have done actually a great job controlling the number of tours in the park how do we control the construction around the national park is a big question and of course the parks are facing also constant pressure from the central government trying to just a uh, um, federal government even like the the india level government as well on uh, infrastructure development highways uh, dam projects mining you know it's just constant battle for all these things and it has to be you know everybody sort of comes together and puts their foot down but who are we to sort of stop that? i'll give you one example i know we are running short of time 
majority we we think when in, in in the international community when people think of wildlife they think of africa you know that's the first thing that comes to the man africa you know is, is a, they don't think india at the end of the day the beauty in india what we have is is incredible because 95% of africans have never been on a safari nobody knows that you know nairobi cape town johannesburg all these people they have actually never been on a safari whenever i go to visit oh like oh my god you're going on a safari but in our mind it's like it's all the wild out there so when somebody is building a highway through the middle of serengeti who's stopping them at the end of it who's stopping the government a bunch of conservationists a bunch of tourism entrepreneurs that's it but the vote bank isn't saying anything because it's for their development so they want the highway to go through the national park in india when something happens uh, on that level throughout the country there is a voice we care we as children went to our national parks and our sanctuaries that there is certain amount of sensitivity to the environment some form or the other when ustad the tiger died for example it was such a big thing not died sorry moved um, in the state of uh, i said it i think it was all for the wrong reasons because science says that the tiger needed to be moved otherwise the villagers would have killed the tiger but the point is a million people tweeted you know thousands of children took a vigil out to the prime minister's gate who does that at the end of the day that's power of the people that's your democracy at play there so if you really want it if you really want it there is enough power in india that can change the the government's decision and it has in many cases who lobbies there's a million people tweeting for one tiger ustad or the tiger that was killed in maharashtra for example there was an out, there was a debate about it in many countries there won't even be a debate about it uh, let's put it that way so i'll leave you with that i think that's a great positive note to end this session on i'm going to hand this back to asad and thank you to all the panelists for sharing their insights today thank you uh, thank you the panel for such a wonderful session and you know especially these these facts a million people actually care which is something i think we should all hold on to um you know shivya thank you for uh, for moderating this session so skillfully uh, i mean i honestly feel that we're all going to come out more sensitive more responsible more rational trying to do the right things however small we can make an impact we're going to do it um uh, but a big thank you to our partners for this evening uh, rare india especially to shobha mohan and shobhna jain well, they've been just so helpful and gracious and uh, i mean and forthcoming and welcoming and anything we ask them they they say yes to so thank you for making this possible um we have many more interesting programs lined up for you guys you know have it has a, a plethora of programs each day especially in the sustainability now series um our next uh, program is on saturday uh, which is discovering sound uh, through the universal music uh, principles and then the following uh, uh, week uh, on on thursday on the 10th we have uh, 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 the the second edition of our series cultural capitals looking at the future legacies of indian cities and we are going to be talking about the city of jaipur um uh, so to find out more just stalk us on social media or check out our website until then stay safe stay healthy stay happy and remember that learning never stops thank you very much have a wonderful evening and the panel once again thank you for such an insightful discussion good night